Hello and welcome to The Passion Show. My name is Phil and joining me as always is my co-host Kyle. Hello. And this week we are joined by storyboard artist Jay Clark. Hello there. <laughs> So in today's episode, we're talking about um, storyboard art. Jay's worked on a variety of projects. Uh, yeah, so before we get into like those projects and what you've worked on, why don't you tell us what a storyboard artist does and like what your role is within film productions? Oh, sure. It's always a, um, it's always a tricky one, isn't it? I know when <laughs> anyone ever asks me um, and I say, it's always followed by a sort of the eyebrow goes up and yeah. awkward confusion because it's, it's not a term you sort of, often here in the um, in the everyday world. Yeah, it's not something that's really thrown and around in the canon of film, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's sort of, um, it's a little bit like those um, sort of behind the curtains type jobs. No one yeah, ever yeah. sort of sees what you do, but hopefully they sort of feel it in the final, the final product. So I always sort of try to liken it, well, first off I say it's an illustrator effectively, but working in film and animation, because yeah. there's certainly a lot of drawing to it. But really, the, the sort of nuts and bolts of it are that you, you, you're sort of going to be helping the director and the writer and the producer and however big the team is or however small, you're going to be trying to sort of visualize their film, their TV show, their advert, uh, and almost like a sort of fortune teller. Everyone wants to sort of jump forward a year or mm-hmm. six months or, or even sometimes five years and just sort of get a sense of what this thing is before anybody spent a lot of money yeah. and so this the storyboard artist effectively it becomes a sort of um like a blueprint mm-hmm. like a architectural blueprint but instead of making like a house or a chair you're sort of all setting about making like a film experience so yeah, uh, yeah i always kind of round off with that that it's that you're effectively sort of helping design uh, a film experience it's, it's like you're setting the foundations for a film almost you're, you're putting it to picture for the first time whereas previously it's just been in words hasn't it especially with a film from like you've worked with Aardman those films take a really long time to create because of the challenge of like stop motion animation so I, I imagine like your storyboards are really influential in like shaping how the film's going to look and stuff like that yeah it's a great opportunity for especially if a director is, has a strong vision it's mm-hmm. really a chance to sort of uh, you know, figure that out and not be under too much pressure because the most of the time the filming hasn't fully begun and the budgets haven't started growing in the team. Mm-hmm. So it's really a chance for them to sort of get close to that zeitgeist of, of what got them excited about it in the first first place, really. But it is it is fun, and um, you know, I think that everyone sort of knows that feeling of when everybody reads a book. You know, you get every every person that reads that novel is going to go away with different images in their head. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're going to see the character in a different way, and that even actions they're going to sort of um, go. Oh, I, oh, I see that quite like quite vividly. But you'll often get that in a script. You know, you'll have a big department, and everyone sort of thinks they're on the same page, but inevitably everybody sort of goes away with slightly different ideas. So the 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 main tool of the storyboard is to try and sort of cut down on that a little bit and just you know they say a, pic- a picture speaks a thousand words and quite often you will had a thousand words with the director to get to that picture yeah. but it, it's a it's a kind of shortcut just to make sure that everybody's sort of singing from the the same hymn sheet effectively so how did you get started as a storyboard artist like where did it all where did your passion begin oh that's such a nice word and i appreciate that you're your show is, you know, has that that word passion in it because um, for me it was a sort of unexplainable, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I was very, very young. I kind of suspected that this sort of thing went on behind the scenes and I would occasionally see a storyboard from, you know, say a a classic film like Wizard of Oz and, you Mm -hmm. know, see that someone had drawn and rendered the Emerald City and, um, you know, I certainly have vivid memories of seeing that and the storyboards from Jurassic Park just sort of blew my mind really that you could have a film you know on such a grand scale so so sort of epic and and out there and yet you know to see some of these initial scribbles by Spielberg and you know a storyboard artist taking those scribbles and making them into sort of more detailed storyboards just very very simple line drawing it 
I just remember even then, uh, I guess that must have been around 92, just, just feeling that sort of, you know, just that kind of shock of like, wow, you can really just figure these things out on paper and then it can grow and all the different teams can come in and just take it to that next level. And then, you know, it's, it's just amazing that these things can then be seen in the cinema with people and, and just have a life of their own then. Yeah, it is interesting the way you you take a whole film and you condense it down into like these pages, basically, like these drawings, but it's still it still conveys like the core of the film and I imagine seeing that turn into like a feature length thing in the cinema is like a really rewarding thing for you. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I, I often do little lectures to, you know, sort of students or people that are learning storyboards and stuff and I always say that, you know, that, that buzz of like getting something through the process, like an idea or a pose or, or whatever it may be, you know, if it sort of makes it all the way through to that final you know, film or, or, or adverts or anything. It's, it's such a buzz. And, um, you know, there's going to be a heck of a lot that doesn't make it through and a lot of dead ends and uh, red herrings and stuff. So you just, you sort of latch onto those things that do to sort of get you through the, the, the long um, schedules or the, the sort of tense deadlines and things like that. We've mentioned a few things that you've been involved with, like Ardman and stuff like that, but why don't you run us through um, your career a bit, like maybe some personal highlights in in animation and like stop motion mm. well the funny thing is when I first kind of got kicked out into the real world outside of university I didn't it, it there was nowhere to sort of learn storyboarding storyboarding mm-hmm. is the sort of American invention in a way it, it sort of stems right back to Walt Disney you know kind of pushing the script to one side on Snow White and just saying let's just start drawing this thing and get it up on boards and that's that where that whole kind of phrase came from storyboards mm-hmm. and it, it you know when i kind of got into the industry it was still very much an american um invention and when i got the opportunity to go to ardman for some work experience it soon became apparent that a lot of the storyboarders they were using um from dreamworks mm-hmm. where they were sort of partnered at that time and so it, it it was very difficult to sort of find your feet as a fledgling, you know, person and, and, and try and work your way up a ladder because it didn't sort of exist really. I mean, over the years, Ardman have, you know, they've tried to invest in, in English storyboarders and, and, and try to sort of raise the level and everything. But yeah. uh, back when I started, it was very much a sort of American dominated thing. So I kind of had to take a slight detour mm-hmm. and it was a fun detour. But I effectively my first job was in the art department on Curse of the Were Rabbit. Yeah, and I was drawing all the spades and the sheds and um, you know the grandfather clocks and just uh, you name it. Everything in that film had <laughs> to be made, and so it, it had to be sort of designed and drawn. Um, and that was basically my sort of foot in the door, really. Mm-hmm. I think um, it's interesting when you watch a film such as like Curse of the Were Rabbit and you see how much is going on within the frame and all these little things need to be hand drawn and created to create one whole picture together i think that must be quite like rewarding yeah it's it's everything you know it's a talk about a blank canvas i mean absolutely Mm -hmm. nothing exists um before those films get going and everything has to be sort of thought through generated and created and even though i was just a junior dress person in the art department i still felt that there were opportunities you know, in very subtle ways to try and contribute mm-hmm. to, to the bigger story that Nick Park was telling and that they were always looking out for opportunities. So that I recall, you know, even in the graveyard scene with the vicar, mm-hmm. when he's kind of tending to his vegetables before the were-rabbit attacks for the yeah. first time. And, you know, there was a statue in the graveyard and um, that had to be drawn and it just felt cool to be able to perhaps you know, I knew it was going to be in a very creepy shot, you know, like a point, point of view shot of the vicar looking yeah. around, slightly scared. And so I just offered the the idea that the statue was pointing up to the moon, you know, as a sort of indicator that, you know, strange and mysterious things were happening, you know, due to this kind of moon werewolf, uh, were-rabbit uh, situation. So even on a very sort of simple level of just creating a little graveyard statue, you can always be looking for, for opportunities to sort of contribute to um, 
to the story and mm-hmm. um, I think audiences subconsciously pick up on it and yeah, as, I think, you, I think definitely as you say do. with yeah. Ardman they're kind of actively looking for it they're, they, they, Ardman are well known for their sort of background gags and little mm-hmm. details and things yeah, I think it's definitely contributes to the overall feel of the film. Like you, we sort of alluded then to your process of, you know, when you're presented with a new project. Do you want to sort of run through um, your, you know, your process when a new like film or TV show is given to you, like a new script? What's your first port of call? Oh well, it's sort of different every time a little bit, and that's mm-hmm. what keeps keeps the job fresh. The director is, is going to sort of lead on how. Um, how involved you are, how open things are to, to contribute. So in, in that scenario, you'll have a situation where they'll say you've got, you know, you've got certain constraints because they've been working on the script and generating a rough sort of idea, but they'll kind of say, you, you know, go, go at it, you know, be, you know, if there's opportunities to, to find humor or tension, mm-hmm. um, you know, but for me, the first port call really is trying to sort of find visuals, real strong visuals that help tell the score story so you, you're looking at um, dialogue that's been said or an atmosphere or an immersion and yeah. you're just constantly sort of trying to find um, really nice visual ways of communicating that um, again in a kind of subconscious way um, you don't want to spell things out but you just want to sort of give the audience a, a feel um, I'm definitely part of the sort of school of thought that a film works its best when you can turn the volume down and still kind of understand what's going on you yeah, know, going yeah. all the way back to sort of silent cinema that through body language and through how you decide where to cut to a wide shot and where you decide to sort of move the camera in slowly you're always trying to sort of um, you know visually sort of tell what's going on in the scene and um, so that's that's my sort of first port call and really the only way to do that is to just start something grab a pen and paper and, and just start writing down mm-hmm. you know shot lists um, I found lately kind of the way I like to do it is I, I like to almost prepare a full shot list really in writing mm-hmm. and that in a way that kind of gets your mind going visually as you're doing it you're already starting to sort of try and visualize the, the shots a little bit so that when you do start thumbnailing um, and making little rough sketches you, you've already been you, you know your brain's been sort of bubbling away a little bit Do you um, do you spend a lot of time with the directors when you're um when you're building this film because obviously there's like I imagine there's a lot of pressure on on you as a and your role because it's kind of like the first sort of stepping stones of the film becoming a visual medium isn't it yeah I mean definitely the depending on the size of the production mm-hmm. if it's a big big sizable thing then you'll you'll have a much more structured situation where you've got a team of people and uh, you know effectively a story team that works quite tightly with the edit department hand in glove and you'll get sort of designated time to you know meet with the director they'll pitch you how they want to they call it kind of launch mm-hmm. again this american phrase where it sounds like they're going to throw you out of a building or something i've never <laughs> quite liked that word but it's um you know we're going to launch you now and this is the, this idea that they'll take everything that they've been thinking about and preparing and they'll give to you and that will give you the best sort of starting point to, to jump off and start storyboarding so there's that kind of aspect and then you're very much on a schedule situation where you'll have time again booked in to meet with them and then if you work on smaller projects even smaller films or commercials you'll be working much more sort of directly with the, the, the director really um, and that's nice that's it's, it's intimate and um, you know quite often it's that's a nice way of building up a relationship, you know, for future work that you have a more intimate sort of um, communication. You know, for instance, some directors like to just sort of step away and leave you to it and then mm-hmm. come back with fresh eyes. Wes Anderson, I've done a few with him and he's, it's, I always think of Wes, it's like a sort of real time situation. You know, if I, if I, if I'm doing a drawing, he's kind of keen to see it. Yeah, yeah. And if I've got a question, he's going to answer it. And, yeah. um, you know, if he's asking where the next, scene is you know he wants an answer it's a sort of real-time um experience uh with with wes so like i say it's sort of different different to each director really yeah yeah because obviously you've worked with you just mentioned then wes anderson you've obviously worked with um nick park but i mean even when i was young i always responded to films that had strong visual style Mm -hmm. um and you know that kind of 
what people say about when you see the first few frames of a film, you know, if you can sort of guess the director, then those tend to be the kind of films that I liked when I was growing up and, you know, to this day, like, and, um, you know, your kind of Hitchcocks and your Spielbergs and, you, you know, you sort of the directors that have a, just a particular way of doing it and the, it's the way they move the camera and the way mm-hmm. they kind of deal with blocking, which is sort of moving the actors around. It's this constant sort of choreography and dance, really. That's yeah. all film is, really. It's, it's just moving things around in space and, you know, dealing with them in time, really. You know, you've yeah. got film space, which is completely different to real space. You know, as you guys know, you can start a shot you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a New York office and walk through the door and appear in a forest, you know, in um, Cornwall. <laughs> it's, a, it's a sort of fluid um, space. And likewise with time, you can shrink and contract it. You know, you can make a tense scene that in reality lasts for about 30 seconds. You can kind of stretch that out mm-hmm. so that it lasts longer. Um, and equally, you can sort of contract time so that I find quite fascinating and, and yeah. those directors that I sort of mentioned that they're, they're very sort of um, they're confident with how they do that and it's it's a it's almost like a sort of handwriting the way they um, deal with those things it's very sort of recognizable yeah it's very like artistic and it hints to the idea of like uh, authorship within film of having these influential bodies of work basically that hint towards a director you were saying before that it's a role that isn't taught That was quite an interesting sentiment because do you feel like it should, like storyboard artistry should be taught more so? Absolutely. And even even now I do a lot of work uh, when I can with film festivals or school children. And, you know, they're just, you know, you know what it's like, guys, when we're young, everybody just draws and and we love to draw. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, somewhere around the kind of junior school time you know possibly a little further people start to um start to think well maybe i can't draw maybe i'm not good and you know there's a confidence factor or what people assume is a good drawing and stuff and the the fun thing about storyboarding i always say it's great to do a a cool visual you know if you can do a really nice storyboard and it wows everyone then brilliant but storyboarding in a way is a little bit like um you know, the Pictionary game, you know, where you've yeah. sort of got to kind of communicate something as quickly as you can and not get too precious about it because, you know, maybe an hour from now you're going to find out, you know, a scene you've been working on for a few days has been cut because it's just not helping the story or they've figured out another scene that can tell the story better. So you can't get too precious. Mm-hmm. So in a way, every when everyone begins drawing sort of four, five, six onwards, the sort of ideal story order in a way. Um, you know, that's what they're doing. They're sort of communicating what they're seeing in in the real world, trying to make sense of it all and, and make these, you know, cool little drawings. I mean, for me, still one of the biggest, um, you know, joys in my life is remembering now that took a little crane frame, you know, just put it in a very simple little frame up on their wall and stuff. And, you know, that was a big, big deal for me back then. <laughs> I think yeah. it's all been downhill from there, but, you know, just that sense that you could, do something that someone could appreciate it and it, it certainly is happening there's more and more like I say I was involved with the school last week that, mm-hmm. that got in touch with Armin and they were trying to encourage their young students to make little films and animations for a film festival and we were doing a little chat with them on, on Skype actually mm-hmm. and um, you know so it, it's definitely it, it's happening a lot more it didn't happen when I was younger you know the, the fact that kids have got um, access to cameras and, and YouTube and can make their own channels. And, um, you know, it's a really exciting time. So mm-hmm. it, the, the um, appetite is there, I think, for, for young filmmakers. So if storyboarding can be encouraged because, you know, it's that typical thing, isn't it? When you want to do a project, you just want to rush straight in and make the thing and, mm-hmm. um, you know, have the excitement of, of getting a camera or making a little plasticine character and starting to animate it. And so always what we're trying to do with storyboarding is just say, just just put the brakes on slightly. Mm-hmm. I know it's really exciting, but if you do take that time to start to do little drawings, um, think about what you're going to do, it, it's just such a great way to, to come up with strong ideas, strong visuals, and, and hopefully set your film you know, apart. 
so it's, it's always that thing of just saying you know just just take that time um to do a storyboard really and um you know you, it, will, it will definitely reap a lot of benefit i found it interesting when you said before about when you were younger and the idea of like drawing something that people would enjoy and i kind of it's kind of like a simple sentiment but it's nice that it's it's just it stems from just wanting to draw something and want it wanting that to be appreciated yeah completely because you having done this for quite a few years now mm-hmm. it's there is a psychological part to it but it doesn't get talked about which yeah. is that it is a sort of you know if you're on a film something like isle of dogs and you know, on that particular case, I was the only storyboarder on it, which is, you know, fun and challenging. Mm-hmm. But it's a big mountain to climb, and you're going to make the film over a period of about two years, uh, you know, a film which lasts for about 90 minutes, really. Yeah, yeah. But you're going to be sort of making many versions of that film and tweaking and scenes that, like I said, just don't sort of go anywhere. But um, everybody knows that now, and they're not going to spend money on it. And, um, you know, so there is a, there's quite a tough psychological part to it sometimes, and 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 that's always a tricky one to get across to children. You know, yes, mm-hmm. it's drawing and yes, it's fun, but there is, you know, it's a business and it's a job, and you're getting paid to do a job, and people want results. And so, anytime you can just bring it back to that pure pleasure of, of mm-hmm. drawing, and you know, getting someone to laugh at a drawing, or you know, making the director laugh or making the writer see the scene and say wow that's kind of so cool what you've done you've taken what i did and you've just taken it to that next step and so that's you're always looking for sort of that that type of thing um and you know i always feel that if you're sort of bringing your best game to it hopefully that's what continues all the way down the line with the model makers and the animators and Mm -hmm. the editors you know everybody's just trying to do their little bit to, to make it as good as it can be, really. Yeah, it kind of takes the pressure off when you're um, reassured that what you're doing is good and worthy and, like, uh, the art that you're creating is a contribution to this, like, great thing. You're going to get those moments and you're going to get a lot of moments where it, it's not gone right and it's it's going wrong and it's not feeling good and you might be on a roll where you work on sequences that just kind of don't come to full fruition. Mm-hmm. And, and what I, what I found quite tough early on in my career is that you should never really, I always say this to storyboarders, you should never take it personally because unfortunately in a way with the sort of canaries in the coal mine, you know, we're sort of put down quite early on into these yeah, problems yeah. to try and find them. And, you know, in, in the best kind of productions, that's understood and accepted and that you, you're sort of doing that role. And sometimes you can get a scenario where people are, I don't know, there's fingers being pointed and stuff like that. And it, it's not always a nice feeling and it's not fair. So I, I'm always quite wary about that, that it, it's quite easy to say, well, it's not working because of the storyboard or, or something like that. So that's, that's really always got to be sort of avoided on a production if it can. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and usually it is. In a, like, work a day for you, how many drawings do you end up drawing? Um, so, for instance, I guess it's always different. And um, in terms of if you're working on, like I've just finished on Morph. Do you remember Morph, guys? Yeah, I love Morph. Brown, yeah, he's a sick dude. Yeah, well, he's yeah. making a big comeback. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, got a new series coming out called The Epic Adventures of Morph. So, that's, okay, as, you know, like the title says, you know, he's sort of he's, he leaves the, the desk and goes off onto all kinds of crazy inventions and that will be out on sky um later on in this year so those those are really even though they're epic they're very simple character led mm-hmm. things and they're kind of gags and they're almost a little bit like tex avery or warner bros each episode lasted for about five minutes so really a five minute episode i'd be looking at having to get a first pass out in about two weeks so you know, by that two weeks, you've got the whole thing up and running, and then people can start to react and say what's working, not what's not working. Um, so you'd be averaging, you know, probably a good 20 drawings a day or something, because wow. you're moving quite quickly. And then something on a feature where it's much perhaps more um, detailed, a lot more characters, um, the settings are maybe more complex, then you might be looking at sort of getting that down to about 10 images a day ideally that's um, still quite a lot get... yeah i mean the fun thing the thing i'm working on at the moment is a feature and I'm, I'm just what you know what we call thumbnailing which is trying to get through effectively about 60 shots for this scene so that's sort of 60 little images 
and you know, I'm trying to get through about 20 a day, you know, breaking it down that way. And, um, you know, by, by working quite small and keeping the detail limited, you, you're really just trying to get it up on, on pages so that you can then reconvene with your directors and just let them know what you're thinking and whether you've hit some of the marks that they've been asking for. And then you'll start the sort of more labor intensive work of, of working those images up a bit more detailed, a bit more animation. The thumbnail, the thumbnail is really fun. It's always, you know, one of the one of the favourite parts of it. Um, thumbnailing and when you finish, that's the other. <laughs> <laughs> when it's done. <laughs> yeah, when you're done. You, you mentioned before about when you talk to like younger children and stuff like that about what you do. You've got to say that you you have to be able to take criticism, and I like that idea of like teaching people about how to get into this sort of field. So, like, is there any other advice you'd give to people who wanna? have an artistic career in film well i i think that um what i what i say from a something that any any child or student can do right from day one is that they can you know if they love film i mean you, you've got to kind of love it <laughs> otherwise mm-hmm. it's a slightly crazy business to get into yeah because you know it's, it's not the most secure and it, you know there's a lot of ups and downs with it and a lot of hard work but if you really do love it then you need to sort of in a way almost step back from that and analyze you know look at some of the the films that really you know that you love and adore and um i always say watch them with the sound down that's that's an old exercise yeah, yeah. that's been around for quite a while but you'd be absolutely amazed by just turning the volume off and watching some of those films that you love or if there's a particular scene I always love the scene in Red as a Lost, um, sorry, the India, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the little sequence at the beginning with the diamond, mm-hmm. where they're all rushing around trying to get this diamond in this nightclub. And it, it's just, I just love the energy of it. And yeah. I try and, you know, re, when I was young, recreate it with friends just for fun and stuff. But, you know, it's only when you actually take that choice to say, well, I'm going to look at that scene and I'm just going to kind of turn the volume down and I'm going to look at how his shot choices are and how quickly the editing moves and when it slows down and, and just get really sort of analytical about it. So I always, I always recommend doing that. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. So what I, what I realized over time is that again, if you really do love these things and sort of obsess over mm-hmm. them, um, you know, collect films, go to, go to, um, you know, conventions, just, just read movie books. What, what that does is it, it, it almost sort of draws these things into your life so mm-hmm. that, eventually you might just come across a particular person who knows a particular person or oh my uncle used to you know work in films and and what it does by being slightly sort of obsessive about it <laughs> is that you, you do find that it sort of draws you know it's that classic sort of cliche isn't it of you you know if you're open slightly to the universe you know things are sort of going to come your way and that, that was certainly you know my experience looking back is that you know in yorkshire you know, how do you sort of make that, that leap? Mm-hmm. Well, I would look at people that had, you know, like Nick Park from, from Lancashire, you know, how had he sort of made that jump, you know, doing the amazing things that he did. And, you know, it just happened to be that around about my GCSEs, a magazine came through the post, you know, I don't think they do it anymore, but banks, I think it was Barclays Bank used to send out, you know, like a monthly magazine. And, and this particular magazine just had a little, you know, Nick on the front cover and, a, a, and an article about, you know, what, what he what he does, where he'd come from. And, and again, it's that sort of thing of that if you're thinking about these things and, um, and pondering, you know, things are going to come your way. And, you know, it, it was just interesting to see his trajectory mm-hmm. so that that led me to Sheffield Hallam, where he'd gone, which, you know, in the sort of serendipity of, of the third year, the, the fact that he gave like a bursary it was only about five hundred pounds, but you had to sort of enter, you know, ideas in order to win the bursary. And you know, to sort of cut a long story short, that's how I got my kind of foot in the door with Ardman. Mm-hmm. And so you just, you know, that's just all from very, very simple, you know, beginnings of trying to think about these things and and just be excited about them. And um, you know, I'm sh- I'm sure that's the case even if you want to be a vet, you know, or something. It, yeah. you know, you're just going you're just going to be thinking about these things. Um, uh, collecting stories, collecting books on it, and um, you know, you just never know what's sort of going to come your way. But you have to be open to it. That's the trick. Yeah, 
I think it, you did sort of allude to the idea that it is sort of dependent on who you know and where you're from and stuff like that. But I like the sort of overarching idea that if you are truly like passionate about this thing, I had to drop the word passionate in there. <laughs> if you are truly yeah, yeah. passionate about this thing, then it will sort of happen for you if you're like committed to work to it. I quite I quite like that sentiment for people listening. It's cool. Like, what's your like proudest work that you've created? Oh, I suppose I have to say my daughter, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> if she, if she hears it. that one, I'll get that in there. <laughs> <laughs> the fun, the fun thing actually about my daughter, she's about nine, and you know, we talk about these these things that she's getting to that point where starting to be interested in films and editing, and it's mm-hmm. it's just really fun to sort of see um, that in young children, isn't it? And, and sort of remember that. But um, yeah, I guess in terms of film. I mean, Isle of Dogs was always, it was always up there for me because it was a challenge to say, you know, can, could you sort of do the entire film? And it didn't really begin that way. It just kind of evolved. And, um, you know, the fun thing about that is that sometimes in storyboarding, you get a little bit typecast, you know, you Mm -hmm. get orders that are good at action or, you know, he's good at comedy or she's, you know, good at um, creating nice, strong uh, visuals and things. And so sometimes you can get a little bit typecast and, only work on dramatic scenes or only work on special effects movies and things mm-hmm. like that. And, but to sort of do a film from start to finish, it means you're going to get that whole gamut of, you know, you're going to get the fun stuff and you're going to get the tense scenes. And so that's quite unique. And I was pleased to be able to sort of get to the, to the other side in one piece. And mm-hmm. um, Grand Budapest Hotel was fun because it was fun to see 2D drawings become real life and, that's always quite a fun. Grand Budapest Hotel is a beautiful film. I was going to say both both um, Isle of Dogs and Grand Budapest are really like beautiful films. Like I remember going to see Grand Budapest when it came out, and I just remember it was one of like the first films I saw that like sort of blew me away. And I was I was like, wow, this is like the potential of film. I always think about that um, the sledding scene where they're going down the mountain. Yeah, I was thinking yeah, about that, and I was—I was, I, I genuinely imagined like how how that would be created. I was thinking, how is this shot? But then you sort of <laughs> yeah. go back a step, and you're like, well, how was this drawn? Who thought about this? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's it's really. Um, I mean, all all weather films are really kind of tightly constructed, and mm-hmm. there's not a shot in there that is wasteful. Uh, you know, it's. A, I mean, not to sort of say that Michael Bay's films are mm-hmm. not good, but that's an example of where there's many many shots and the cutting. Yeah, very yeah. Rapid and you go, might go from a high angle to a low angle and you know Wes just works in a very sort of rigorous way which is quite satisfying as a yeah. storyboarder if you know if this, you know each shot kind of leads on to the next shot and it's sort of there like for a reason like a big sort of jigsaw so that's quite fun but um, I mean I, Grand Budapest was beautiful locations and, and everything about it the time and everything the, the weird thing about Isle of Dogs is to make a beautiful film, you know, set on a kind of garbage nuclear waste. Yeah, it's up. quite it's quite a daunting task, I imagine. Yeah, but the, that that film itself dog. looks like so vibrant and like nice to look at. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So you're working so, on Morph currently, aren't you? That's coming out at the end of this year. Yeah, I kind of wrapped on Morph on Friday and then jumped straight into this next uh, job on Monday. So it's tiny bit of crossover and yeah, yeah. a holiday somewhere but um, it was for Netflix animation so I was curious you know that I mean the script's really nice also mm-hmm. but I was just curious about that whole kind of Netflix uh, thing that's going on at the moment it seems like a lot of passion projects again that word passion project yeah yeah are, are gravitating towards you know Netflix and you know you have the likes of Scorsese and um, mm-hmm. you know all these kind of film makers that have perhaps have these projects that haven't got going over studios um, nevertheless as sort of finding a footing at Netflix so I, th- I thought that was interesting yeah. to, to get involved with those um, with those guys and sort of see what that's about really and yeah, it's um, like a, you know, so far it's quite interesting it's like a different side of filmmaking isn't it kind of uncharted at the minute so I think it is interesting that even older and newer filmmakers are all sort of jumping on Netflix to get like, like these passion projects made Mm. Yeah, it is like you say, isn't it? Um, so it's just completely sort of a bit uncharted territory. Yeah. And, you know, but in a way that's that's exciting, I guess, for film. You know, this kind of old medium that can keep sort of evolving and tricking people and, and surprising them and stuff. 
Thanks as always to Kyle for being my co-host. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, thanks to Jay Clark for coming on to talk about storyboarding. We really appreciate it. It um, was really insightful. Yeah, thanks to, just again, thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. And like I said, when you got, got in touch, very flattered to be asked. So yeah, yeah. You. Yeah, it was it was a pleasure having you on. If you have any passions yourself that you want us to talk about on the show, feel free to leave them in the comments below because we'll be happy to talk about them always. Or hit us up in the DMs if you want to show your passion on the passion show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you want to come on the show and talk about anything you're passionate about, we'd be more than happy to have you. But other than that, thanks to Jay, and we'll see you next time. Have a good day. <laughs>